Taking over responsibility for security in Afghanistan, international troops step back from the front line after 12 years of fighting. Afghan forces will now be in charge. But has the war effort been a success? And what is Afghanistan inheriting? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. It was a war born out of the coordinated attacks on the U.S. on September 11, 2001. The American president at the time, George Bush, called it the war on terror, and it became synonymous with the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Twelve years later, and the war in Afghanistan has reached a major milestone. Afghan security forces are taking over responsibility for the whole of the country, including many areas still considered volatile and dangerous. It is the beginning of what is being called the fifth and final phase of the drawdown. Most international combat troops will leave Afghanistan by the end of next year, leaving an unspecified number in training and support roles. Now, while the drawdown has been gradual, the U.S. reaction to the 9-11 attacks in 2001 was a swift one. Within days, the U.S. Congress passed a law authorizing the use of military force against what it called terrorists. And on October 7th, Operation Enduring Freedom began attacking Taliban and al-Qaeda targets inside Afghanistan. The U.S.-led operation was backed by Western allies and justified as an act of collective self-defense, but it was not authorized by the United Nations Security Council. By December, the U.N. agreed to the creation of an international security assistance force to take all measures necessary to help maintain Afghan security. Now, six months after September 11th, the then U.S. President George Bush laid out his vision for achieving peace in Afghanistan. He said it would mean helping the country to develop its own stable government, to train and develop its own national army, and build an education system for both boys and girls, a system that works. So to what extent, then, have those goals been achieved? Let's discuss all this with our guests in Kabul, Dawood Sultanzoy, a former Afghan member of parliament. In our Washington studios, Mark Kimmett, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, and also joining us from Kabul, Sonia Iqbal, a member of the Afghanistan 1400 Civil and Political Movement. Uh, Dawood Sultanzoy in Kabul, have some of these stated U.S. goals then been achieved 12 years on? Does Afghanistan have a stable government? Does it have a strong and efficient national army that can now take the lead? Uh, I think uh, we cannot shortchange the achievements uh, of creating an army to where we are, but this uh, journey was not ambitious enough in creating our security forces. We are not, uh, by the by defici- definition of complete, it's not a complete uh, security force. We still lack major uh, sections of the military in terms of uh, uh, the operational aspects, in terms of intelligence, in terms of air force and armored uh, uh, capabilities. So while it is an achievement, it's not complete and it's not total and we have a long way to go and we we need to work on that. Is this the right time then for foreign troops to be taking the back seat? I mean to what extent are you confident that the Afghan forces can in fact secure the country? Well, I'm not, uh, I don't have any illusions about the capability of Afghan uh, uh, forces. Uh, they will do whatever they have uh, in their hands. They will do whatever they can with those. Uh, uh, and also, let's not forget that they have done whatever they could with even the most limited capabilities. It's not their will, it's not their commitment, but it's the capabilities that are lacking, and we need to work on that. And not only the military aspects, but we also need to work on the non-military aspects of uh, a security apparatus. It's the governance, it's the rule of law, it's the civilian aspects of what the military achievements can be enhanced with. And that is what is lacking. And our military forces will sacrifice themselves, will do whatever they can. But it's the civilian aspects of our government that is suffering, that is causing the people to to lose confidence, corruption, rule of law, weak governance, and selfish uh, po- political uh, uh, leadership. These are the things that people are working worried about or and alienated by. A whole host of problems and challenges then facing this Afghan army. Mark Kimmett, is it the right time then for foreign troops to be giving the Afghan National Army uh, the lead on security when clearly they are lacking, as Mr. Sultanzoy said, 
a lot of capabilities, weapons as well, training perhaps, uh, even though their numbers have increased. And there has been a noticeable increase in recent days and recent weeks in Taliban attacks, not just around the country, but in Kabul itself in Kabul International Airport against the Justice Ministry just a few days ago, an audacious attack in broad daylight. Yeah, I think your uh, earlier um, commenter was exactly right. Uh, the military has come a very, very long way, but I think it's important to understand that just because we now have the Afghans in operational lead doesn't mean that the militaries of the other nations are walking out the door or sitting behind bunkers and not doing anything. Afghan forces will have the lead. The coalition forces will still be in support, capable of running operations for a period of time. Even beyond 2014, there will be a residual force that will be there to help the Afghan military. Plus, the nations have committed it as a part of the Chicago process to provide the funding uh, for a number of years on the order of 4.1 to 5 billion a year and to continue training and mentoring. So let's not misunderstand what's happening this week if announced. Uh, what is happening is simply part of the transition, but it's transition and not complete handover. But it is a retreat, isn't it, though, for U.S. and other foreign troops? I mean, when you look back at the stated aims, uh, not of the Bush administration, but the Obama administration, let me quote, uh, one of the aims, a strategic goal, was to defeat and prevent the return of al-Qaeda and its affiliates. Has that been achieved? Or is the U.S. looking for a way out of this and basing it more on what the political reality is in Washington and other Western capitals than on what it is on the ground in provinces like Gaza? like Helmand in Kabul itself. No, I, I think using the term retreat is unfair. Uh, this is part of the handover. It has always been the goal of the nations that we would develop, help Afghanistan develop a sovereign military capability of its own. We cannot do that for the Afghan people forever. This is part of a natural handover that the Afghans have got to be in the lead, have got to be in charge. Uh, we will be there to help, we will be there to reinforce, we will be there to support, but the Afghans have got to want this more than the rest of the world, and this is something that the Afghan troops, in fact, want to do. They want to be in charge, they want to be responsible for their own sovereign security. So to call this a retreat, I think, is an unfair characterization. This has always been part of the process of handing over to Afghan control. Sonia Iqbal, when you look at the situation around you in Afghanistan today, is it a positive development then that this handover uh, in security should be taking place? Uh, yes, I think uh, it has to happen. Uh, the thing is, uh, mm, I would agree with uh, Mr. Sultanzoe on, uh, on the fact that uh, we haven't quite achieved what we would have liked to achieve at this point, you know, 12 years down the road, but we have major achievements that, uh, um, that we have to uh, recognize, especially with the Afghan National Army and the National Police. Uh, we have seen that they have sacrificed their lives and they have tried to minimize the, uh, the civilian casualties and that they have tried to defeat uh, you know, uh, encounters with Taliban and um, in fact if we actually look at the hours that it has taken in, in terms of defeating the Taliban when there has been uh, encounters, the, the number of hours have reduced and we see uh, that uh, every day they are improving in, in, their in their techniques. And, but one thing that we definitely need is, uh, is the support. Uh, I do believe that it's, uh, it's time that uh, we need to take matters on our own hand and we need to take uh, responsibility. And, uh, but, but once again, given that it's, it has only been uh, 10, 11 years since uh, you know, Afghanistan has started uh, you know, uh, building up and the reconstruction process, we, we've not had quite a lot of time. Uh, so at this point, we definitely need the, the support in terms of uh, trainings and equipments. I mean, uh, our army is barely equipped with, uh, 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 with the, the necessary equipments that they, they require, but still they are, they are doing their best in Kabul and also in other provinces. But uh, we are facing challenges, and I'm not sure, um, I, I wouldn't be uh, thinking that you know, the, the challenges are going to be reduced. I think we are going to face challenges this year and next year, and I don't know for how many years, depending on where the, you know, the peace process is uh, going and uh, to what extent we will be able to actually achieve anything. But uh, uh, I do see that do, do we are you, do prepared you think, to take... Do, do you uh, though think, 
that the Afghan forces can prevail militarily over the insurgency, uh, the Taliban. They're at the doors of Kabul, it would seem, uh, and they've made gains in recent weeks. I mean, can they prevail militarily or do they have to eventually sit down and negotiate? Uh, negotiation and you know peace process. Of course, you know it's it's uh, mm, we are in favor of uh, sitting and, and talking. If if that means that we are actually if there are uh, um, you know uh, uh, credible sources and we, we sit and we, we talk. Of course, you know we we are sick of uh, war and it has been for a long time. And I don't think uh, any Afghan is in favor of uh, further fighting. Uh, but if, if that's not an option, then of course uh, the National Army uh, you know, doesn't have any other option but to actually uh, face the, uh, the counterinsurgencies. Dawood Sultan Zoy, how do you see the situation as far as the Taliban is concerned? Will the departure of most U.S. and foreign troops give them an incentive to stop fighting? Or will they continue as they have done in the past? I think uh, it will depend on what we do in the next few months uh, 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 up to the election. If we remove the incentives that uh, allow the Taliban to take advantage of and continue fighting and, and at least neutralize the civilians of Afghanistan uh, to stand uh, 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 neutral, then uh, they would be emboldened and they will take advantage of this uh, vacuum and void. But if we deliver a good election, if we uh, improve uh, uh, on uh, uh, the governance and rule of law and fighting corruption and also the international community has to um, uh, clarify their position because uh, right now the people of Afghanistan the perception with the people is that well it's this is basically an Afghanization of war on terror and we should remove this perception and show a commitment not just military commitment but fighting the real causes of terrorism in this region. Uh, we should uh, pay attention to the sanctuaries. We should pay attention to the supply chain that allows them to be supplied with um, uh, financial aid and other uh, capabilities. And also, we should make sure that the people of Afghanistan are the real players. People are usually forgotten in this whole game. And we should also pay attention to the Afghan domestic calendar, not to uh, the calendars in Washington, Paris, London and Rome and, and Madrid. But uh, also we have to pay attention to those people who are suffering the most, who are the people of this country. The realities on the ground should not be forgotten in this country. We need rule of law. We need good governance. We need fight of, of, against uh, corruption. And b above all, we need a changeover of this government and a good election where the people of Afghanistan have a new choice, new faces and a new energy with new plans and new programs so the young generation of Afghanistan can be engaged again and the Taliban will not be able to breathe the oxygen that is created by this inefficiency. Mark Kimmett, uh, the U.S. administration among many believes that uh, the elections next year in Afghanistan in 2014 will be a crucial test for the political transition in the country. To what extent does negotiation with the Taliban fit into this uh, picture? The Taliban is opening an office in a matter of a few hours here in Doha. How serious will the government have to be about negotiating with them? And in fact, how serious is the U.S. government about encouraging such negotiations? Well, first, I think the United States, like all nations, are very interested in uh, seeing negotiations occur. At the end of the day, the fighting, the only purpose of the fighting or not fighting is to get people to the negotiation table. You asked earlier whether the transfer of military authority to the Afghan forces will have an effect on the, Afghanistan, on the uh, Taliban. And the answer is yes. If the Taliban see that the Afghanistan forces will continue to fight, that will take support away from the Taliban and a willingness out of the part of the Taliban to continue to fight. But if the Taliban think that by the transition to the Afghan forces, uh, they will in fact have the upper hand uh, because of a weaker Afghan force, there's no, there's no need for the Taliban to negotiate because they'll think they can win on the battlefield. So the combination, as was said earlier, of good progress in governance, good progress in terms of providing democracy and freedom to the people, and a strong willingness to stand up to the Taliban militarily, those are the, those are the factors that are going to drive the Taliban to the negotiating table so that we can put an end to the fighting 
and we can move forward in Afghanistan with good governance and an end to the kind of barbaric actions we've seen from the Taliban over time. Uh, Sonia Iqbal, when you look ahead to uh, the next few months, certainly before the elections, what do you think needs to be the most important focus? And to what extent do you see the education system, which was another one of the often stated U.S. aims to ensure that this is going to be a system that works for both boys and girls, has been achieved? You know, basically what we are, um, what we are hoping uh, to happen is uh, uh, for the candidates finally to uh, uh, come in and, you know, uh, present their agendas. I mean, for the first time, I think, you know, we have to move towards uh, uh, elections uh, going from, from individual-centric to actually program-centric, uh, people actually coming with their programs and showing the, uh, uh, the people that uh, uh, what their agendas are and how are they going to address the challenges that we are facing right now. Uh, you know, uh, take it from security to uh, governance, corruption, rule of law, and all of these challenges that we have. And uh, yes, education has been, uh, you know, uh, one of the one of the greatest achievements that we've had in the past uh, ten years. And I think uh, this year, uh, for this election, we are uh, we are seeing a new generation of Afghanistan. We are seeing uh, the people who uh, who are a lot more informed about uh, uh, you know elections, about the processes. You know, they have they have. Uh, They've done this uh, for the, uh, you know, two presidential elections and two parliamentary elections. So by now, people have an expectation of what, what they want to see uh, from the process of the elections, and they're more informed. People Sonia are, Iqbal, uh, well, you mentioned, you mentioned corruption, and Afghanistan has long been criticized for its deep uh, levels of corruption. The latest figures from Transparency International, in fact, rank it 174 out of 176 countries. Unemployment stands at 35 percent, while 36 percent of the population live below the poverty line. The World Bank says 90% of the national budget is still financed by foreign governments and organizations. And NATO Commander General Joseph Dunford is warning that that could be under threat. And speaking on Friday, he said the gains that we have made to date are not going to be sustainable without continued international commitment. Dawood Sultan Zoy, what kind of commitment would you like to see? I think the commitment uh, uh, is not enough in a country where, uh, the, where the whole world is, uh, world is fighting a war in. Uh, we need action also. Commitment alone cannot uh, suffice. I think the action is required not only by the Afghan government at, at the top of the list. I think the international community has to pay attention to what is happening in terms of the realities here, not in terms of realities elsewhere. The other thing that needs to happen is I think we need to pay attention to to the people. We need to engage the society in this country. The society has become totally forgotten and disengaged from the process. Uh, unless a society wants to move forward and wants peace and wants to make a difference in keeping that peace. Uh, military and armies cannot bring peace alone. And I think the international community had put too much emphasis on war for too long, uh, forgetting other aspects of nation building, and now they're forgetting uh, almost a lot of things. I, I, I was in Brussels during the defense minister's meetings. I think they're trying to just build a military in Afghanistan, with a, with a, which is a counter insurgency, insurgency uh, uh, security force. That would be something that will backfire later. Afghanistan is a, uh, is a nation where there are so many threats, and we need to have a robust program for our military and non-military aspects of, of, of a nation. Mark Kimmett, did the U.S. administration get the balance right when it decided that 71 percent of its budget for Afghanistan would be spent on security and training the National Army, that's about $57 billion, that 26 percent of the budget would be spent on governance and development, including building schools and roads and so on, that's uh, about $20 billion, and 3 percent of that budget would be spent on humanitarian projects, around $2 billion? Well, you're never going to get a military guy to say that there's enough governance assistance and capacity building on the civilian side. All of us soldiers always understand that we can do our job on the battlefield, but if there's not something on the governance side, on the civil side, building the institutions, building the frameworks, the educational system, all we're going to do is win on the battlefield, but we're not going to win in the civil society. 
Uh, Joe Dunford, who I know quite well, is exactly right. This is not sustainable if the focus is exclusively on the military. Now, that's of course all you heard in Brussels because in Brussels is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is a security organization. Uh, the real question is what is the UN, what are the, what are the United Nations organizations doing in Afghanistan to build that long-term civil society, elimination of corruption, improvement of education, building of institutions. Uh, it's not enough just to win on the battlefield. No, too much money on the, on the military side is not the right answer. We but do but need you, could, more assistance could, could for that long-term sustainment. Could you ever win on the battlefield, though? I mean, of course the U.S. is going to say that this is mission accomplished when it does leave, at least when its uh, combat troops leave at the end of 2014, but it is not mission accomplished, is it? When you look at the fact that the Taliban are striking at will, the infrastructure in the country is not what it should be, and that's leaving aside the problems of corruption and governance and so on. Another great saying that us soldiers have a tendency to, to, to repeat is you can't kill your way out of the problem. The military portion of the overall operation is simply a means to an end. It is to buy space and time for the civil society to take root. Uh, so no, I don't think anybody's going to be saying mission accomplished. You won't see any military banners at the end of 2014. We've got a long way to go to assist the Afghan society where they can stand on their own. They need to be able to stand on their own militarily, but they also need to be able to stand on their own in terms of civil society, education, health, and all those other critical parameters uh, that truly demonstrate uh, that this is a nation, not simply a battlefield. Uh, Sonia Iqbal, uh, if I can get a final comment on you about civil society in Afghanistan today. I know your organization aims to create a platform for the new generation of Afghans to play a more active role in shaping the future of the government politically, socially, economically. How does the picture, the current picture today looks, look after all these years of foreign involvement in Afghanistan? I think in the once again I would, uh, I would uh, like to uh, you know recognize the, the achievements that we've had in, uh, in the past ten years. One of the major ones have been the um, access to education for the young generation. I mean, we are uh, right now we're talking about a, uh, you know a big force of the uh, a big portion of the society. You know, 60% of the population are under 20. So uh, one of the greatest things that they've had uh, have been the opportunity and access to education. And also they are empowered with information that, uh, you know, previously people were not. Uh, uh, now, you know, 20 million people have, uh, you know, telephones and, uh, you know, the young generation access to Internet. And that actually uh, gives them, uh, you know, information which is power. And, and now they have a will. Uh, now uh, they're not they're not uh, ready to actually step back and you know uh, say that okay you know everything that we've had is uh, gonna go away. No, they're gonna strive, uh, and they're hopeful for uh, uh, being in charge of uh, uh, you know their destiny and uh, taking charge and taking responsibility and facing the challenges. Of course, uh, once again, it's not gonna be easy. You know, we're, we're gonna have a lot of challenges, but. This young generation is uh, is more equipped with uh, with knowledge, with understanding, with a vision for uh, where we want to see Afghanistan uh, in the long run. Because the thing is, it's it's really frustrating for us to actually have these short deadlines of uh, you know 2014 and people thinking that okay, you know 2014 is going to come and everything is going to uh, collapse. No, that's not going to happen. This country has been uh, there. Fine, but, but, but there is. There. You and, mentioned uh, the challenges, but certainly a sense of optimism that you reflect among. Uh, the younger generation. Dawood Sultan Zoy, do you share this optimism? I am very optimistic about uh, uh, our younger generations. Uh, one example is sitting right here uh, in this program. And I think uh, it's the uh, older generation, it's the present generation who's in charge that needs to pay attention to the responsibilities to uh, allow this election to create a bridge between the present generation who's in charge and the future generation. The old guards have to vacate the seats that they have grabbed on for 
12 years and enriched themselves and they still have their guns and their uh, uh, coffers in their hands and we need to pave the road for a future Afghanistan that is rosy, that is going to be prosperous, that are going to be peaceful only if we allow the future generations to cross this bridge and we need to build that bridge during this election for them. On this cautious but positive note, let me thank all our guests on today's program, Dawood Sultan Zoy, Mark Kimmet and Sonia Iqbal. And thank you as always for joining us on Inside Story. Don't forget you can find this program and many more at aljazeera.com. From me, Rida Fakhri and the team, thanks for watching.